Okay. Uh, hi, everyone, and welcome to Doc Talk uh, with myself, Jeff Cote. Today, I have the honor of chatting uh, with a gentleman who had an incredible impact on my life. When I bought my first sailboat uh, in 2006, April Fool's Day, by the way, I suffered uh, catastrophic electrical failure after electrical failure. And through my journey of redeeming my boat and staying committed to boating, the experience taught me the importance of doing things right. And this is how I got to know Nigel Calder through his books, which we're going to talk a little bit later. Welcome, Nigel, to the podcast. Um, Nigel was born and raised in England, uh, where he began sailing dinghies. At the age of 13, he was uh, rebuilding motorcycles and tinkering all things mechanical. After college, he met his wife, Terry, and then they set sail on his brother's 28-foot boat, where they were almost run over by a freighter. After that incident, they stayed inland and build a couple of 70-foot steel hull narrow boats to run the English canals. Would love to do that one day. Then they moved to Louisiana in the United States, and he started his career working on oil rigs. Naturally, the work was quite dangerous, and he learned a deep respect for doing things the right way. Nigel and his wife set sail around the world with their two small children and cramped quarters. There was a change of plans after 18 months. Now they take shorter cruises, mostly in the North Sea and extensively in the Caribbean. Uh, as for boats, uh, Nigel has uh, had quite a few boats. Started off with a 39-foot Ingrid Cutter, a Pacific Sea craft. Worked on those, by the way, quite lovely boats. Followed by a Malo 45 built in Sweden. And this was replaced by the same boat, but with experimental electrical and propulsion systems, which we're going to talk about. It was used by the European Union Hybrid Marine Project, of which Nigel was a technical director, for his extensive testing in hybrid, hybrid propulsion system. Nigel is a member of the American Boat Yacht Council, and he's also a member of their Electrical Project Technical Committee. By the way, for some of you who haven't known, Nigel has written eight books, <laughs> and his most well-known, which I've given to all my technicians uh, over the years, is the Boat Owner's Mechanical and Electrical Manual which is uh, known in our circles as the Bible, and marine diesel engines, maintenance, troubleshooting, and repair. Uh, I've owned both boats, and there's a lot of highlighting in both boats. Again, welcome, uh, Nigel, to our podcast, and thanks for being here today with us. Uh, thank you, Jeff. I, I use the boat owner's manual myself. <laughs> <laughs> I, I can't remember all that stuff. And I have more than once done a job on my own boat and pulled the book out and read not to do what I just did, so... <laughs> yeah, it's, I it's it more these days than ever, actually. <laughs> that's good. That's really good. Yeah. Yeah. So um, maybe let's start a little bit at the beginning. Um, at what point did you know that you were going to be able to carve out, um, you know, this boating life for yourself? How did you sort of, why is this sort of fascination with boating and boating systems in particular? Oh, it goes back to the 1960s, actually, when they had the first round the world race, single-handed round the world race. Mm. Uh, the one that um, uh, Robin Knox Johnson won. And in Suhaley, you know, like a 32-foot double-ended boat. Yeah. And uh, it was headline news in England for weeks. And so a whole load of us on our teams then would sit at school dreaming about sailing around the world. So I guess that's when I got the bug. And uh, so I always wanted to build a boat and do that. And uh, I didn't get the opportunity and, until I started working on the oil rigs because the, the pay was really good. This is, you know, the late 70s, yeah. early 80s. And it provided the income to, to build the Ingrid. We bought the hull, uh, but it had no ballast, no deck, one bulkhead to stop the sides caving in. And that was it. So uh, we, uh, we melted down battery posts to cast the ballast, 7,700 pounds of lead. We... Uh, we we basically we did everything on that boat, built it ourselves, and in the course of doing that, um, I installed all the systems. And and uh, although I'm pretty capable, uh, I, I don't I didn't know the first thing about electricity, uh, and uh, not a whole lot more about mechanics, and uh, there was no decent information available to help. So we kind of struggled through it, and I ended up having to rebuild most of those systems because I didn't get much of it right. And uh, when I figured out if I needed to know that stuff, other people did as well. You know, this was the heyday of home-built boats. Yeah. So there was actually a market for that information. 
So, and that's what prompted me to uh, to write the books. And at the time, uh, the life on the rigs was either insanely busy or else there was a lot of downtime. So I had a fair bit of time out there when I could write. So I, I did much of the initial writing. For my diesel engine book was the first one uh, okay. out on the rigs during the quiet periods. And then the, uh, the boat owner's manual followed that one after we, uh, after I quit and we went sailing. Yeah, it's funny, you know, my journey, or even with my own boat, I think I'm at iteration five on my electrical, mm -hmm. my Cali 36. <laughs> Meaning, you know, I've had literally a flavor with it now. I'm, I'm, I'm basically version five of the electrical. And uh, you look back and you're like, oh my God, did I learn so much on this one? Or okay, I get it, you know. <laughs> it's, yep. it's like, like a lot of things in life, um, it's harder than it seems. I think, and that's that's the challenge with marine electrical, especially 12 or 24 volts, because you're assuming you can't get hurt. What could possibly go wrong? And that's probably the predisposition for many of us to get into these you know, situations that sometimes, you know, it's you need that information to come from somewhere else. You know, and that's a great thing with forums nowadays. And, you know, books is one way and YouTube or whatever it is or talking on the dock or but it's the getting to that closer to that endpoint that is reliable and safe. And yes, that's, that's I, I had to, so, um, for that first edition of the boat owner's manual, I, uh, I went to a bunch of boat shows where I could talk to the gurus of the day, um, Rick Proctor, Dave Smead, Bill Montgomery of Belmar, and all those yep. early, early leaders in the field um, and with the uh, smart, regulators, high output alternators, the early generation of inverters. Uh, I never could afford to stay in a hotel, so I'd rent, rent a car and sleep in the car and uh, go to various boat shows to collect information and then uh, publish the first edition of the boat owner's manual. And I immediately got a bunch of snotty letters from the American Boat and Yacht Council, ABYC, because there was stuff in that book that violated the ABYC standards. So I started going to their meetings and um, I very rapidly went to the second edition. I cleaned it up from a standards perspective. And uh, that was, you know, 30 something years ago now. So I've been going to the ABYC meetings ever since. And I, I've probably learned more in, in those. We used to have two meetings a year, two days of, at each time. I probably learned more in those meetings than any other single source of information I've had over the years. Well, it would, it would be sort of the aggregation of all that knowledge for all those people in the room, right? It's it's sort of all the pain that we've learned through the years. And yep. you're you're just going, dump it, you know, like yep. put it on the table. You know, what are the things you're worrying about? What are the things that got you in trouble? What are the things that you wish you hadn't done? What are yes. the things you wish you would have done differently? Well, and because the focus has always been on safety. I mean, that's what the ABYC does rather than uh, specific practicality. Uh, it's all those things that have caused problems that were potentially dangerous that crop up in the meetings. Uh, yeah. And then uh, there's a discussion about how to, how to resolve those issues. When I first went, there were maybe six people in the room. Uh, and then uh, for a decade or more now, we've had over 40 at every meeting we've had. So it's grown um, very rapidly in terms of participation. And they're mostly yeah. they're engineers in the room. So, and, and uh, they check their company affiliation at the door some issue comes up and before you know it, they're all focused on the issue rather than thinking about well, where would my company be on this issue? So it's a really, uh, it's a great organization um, that's really focused on safety and there's almost no um, marketing or, or company pressure that, that shows up in any of those meetings, which is pretty remarkable. It's the right thing. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely the right thing. I remember a few years ago, I was doing a presentation uh, in Alberta and uh, one of the attendees and the host of the, it was actually, you've done uh, stuff for them. It's uh, Blue Water Cruising Association here in the Pacific Northwest. Well, I know, I, I've done a couple of uh, seminars yeah. in the past. Yeah, I've attended yep. them, by the yep. way. We were there, oh. Melissa, I dragged <laughs> Melissa to one of the host sessions oh, in 2011. Yeah. I was like, oh my God, Nigel's in town. We have to all go, the whole <laughs> office went. <laughs> um, and uh, it was interesting because this engineer uh, with a lot of experience in the oil rigs, um, out in Alberta was saying, you know, about, you know, the difference between sort of what the code is. And he was really emphasizing from a practical standpoint that it's 
you know, it's the minimum, you know, the, yes. the bar. Yeah. And it's funny in our industry, it seems to be opposite. It's sort of almost a holy grail. It's yes. sort of this thing that you'll never get to, but you know what, if you were going to do it, you know, maybe try to get there, but if you don't, then, you know, it's okay. And, and, and he was like, no, it's, it's, I was like, what a great perspective. You know, it's, it's not your objective. It's like, no, no, you got to have that covered as a min mm -hmm. and then go from there. And I think that's the, I guess there's a lot of constraints that force us to maybe see it that way. And I think that one of the reasons it's hard on all of us, both from a time perspective and money perspective as voters to realize what it takes to do it right. You know, it's, it's, it's mm -hmm. always, it's always harder than we all imagine. Um, well, there's no um, place to learn this stuff in the marine industry. There's maybe two or three schools in the whole of the U.S. that have year-long courses. Uh, and outside of that, the ABYC runs classes. But the ABYC is focused on safety. It's not focused on practicality. <clears throat> so there are things that we all should be doing, like putting drip loops in front of connections on our wiring. So if there's any moisture, it drips off. That's yeah. not a safety issue. So it doesn't work its way into the ABYC standards. So that's why they are a minimum. They're, they're basically designed to make sure that the boat doesn't catch fire. Or we don't electrocute somebody on the AC side or we don't sink it from catastrophic corrosion. Um, but there's a, there's a whole ton of stuff we need to do and know that goes beyond the standards that it's not in the standards because it's not directly related to safety. Yeah. For example, there's no requirement to boot positive connections in, in a DC system other than at the battery. Uh, because it's assumed there's a fuse in the system. And if you short circuit from a negative to a positive bus bar, you'll blow the fuse. So theoretically, there's not a safety issue. But at that point, the boat is dead in the water. But you just blew the main battery fuse. So really the obvious thing is we need to boot those connections. But it's not in the standards, because from a safety perspective, uh, they consider having the fuse there is adequate to protect the boat from a catastrophic fire. Yeah. So, so there's a ton of stuff like that, that um, but over the years, I've tried to work into all of my books and publications. And, and um, so that there's a, at least a, one place where we can go and grab all this stuff. And, and you're right. I mean, that journey to perfection, perfection is unattainable. Uh, and we all chase it, or some of us do. The, the challenge, and it's the same thing I see it even on my boat as well, is Safety is one thing, but very close to safety is reliability. You know, being having systems that stay up and running might affect safety, right? You, you know, yeah. losing your electrical system at the dock is annoying. A few things are at play, but you know, at the end of the day, it's you can tolerate it. Losing your electrical system when you're underway, passage making, or in a far away remote anchorage, and you don't know where that fuse is. And you, it's buried, and you didn't put it there, and you don't know where it is. And that fuse took out your whole electrical system. Now you don't have your VHFs anymore. Mm -hmm. You know, you don't, you don't have any. And that's exactly what it is. It's that fear that I, we're always worried about is going. Okay, well, yeah, safety is important, but also as boaters, it's it's hard enough to own a boat. You know, if you lose confidence in the boat over time, you know, some people, you know, their dreams are crushed. They end up yeah. not having the stamina to take it, and they're like, you know yeah. what? My life's hard enough as it is. I, I, I can't I can't have hard at work, hard at home, and hard on my vacations. And so then they go out, they buy out. They're like, you know what? I, you know, I, we're gonna get a cottage instead, or we're gonna just travel. You know, maybe we'll go RVing. We'll just take whatever complexity. I just can't take that level of complexity or you know unknowns with a family or with yeah. a partner or with family you know, friends. And that's also another thing that we always worry about is, you know, is how is the system going to stay up and operating without uh, basically losing people's confidence? Yes. Well, and, and uh, we, you know, as you know, we've done a ton of cruising over the years, um, months at a time. And uh, I, I would say the number one reason that people give up on boating is because of electrical system problems on their boats. And they just get frustrated with chasing the problems uh, and they finally give up and do something else. Agreed. And most of those problems are they should not be happening. They're yeah. insulation problems, they're they're design problems, so they're built into the boat from day one. Uh, mm -hmm. I have never done a really thorough audit, electrical audit of a boat without finding at least one circuit that didn't have adequate overcurrent protection on it. 
Oh, yeah. You know, coming back to the business of suddenly losing power, this is really germane at the minute with lithium ion batteries. Because, you know, every lithium ion battery has a battery management system. Yeah. And if that battery man management system sees some condition arising that threatens the battery, it disconnects the battery. Well, if that's your, your navigation battery and you're going through some difficult reef entry, and all of a sudden, all of your system shut down because the battery decided that there was something going on it didn't like, uh, you're uh, in serious trouble. So uh, one of the things we, we've just written into a draft ABYC standard, we've been working on this damn thing for five years um, because this is, this is uh, difficult and controversial. But one of the things we wrote in there is that these BMSs have to provide an external message before they disconnect. Mm. Uh, and that immediately gets rid of all of those people advertising drop-in lithium ion batteries because they don't have the ability to communicate if they're going to disconnect. Uh, so many of those batteries that we're currently fitting into our boats that don't will not comply with that. It's a technical information bulletin rather than a standard, but they won't comply with that when it comes out. But this is the, the kind of issues that we really need to be focused on as an industry because uh, these things happen. People get into trouble. They get frustrated. They go buy a set of skis or something and give up boating. I totally agree. And, you know, having deal dealing with owners, for people, some people's affliction to voting is not just sort of this, you know, in passing. It's, it's you know, for myself, it was a dream. When I mean a dream, it's all encompassing. It's, it's what I want my, the best times of my life, I wanted to be on the water. And to, you know, because the electrical system, like you say, might not be reliable. Uh, and to see those people get out of voting and to effectively change course on a life goal. A lot of them wait, you know, work, work, work. And then they, they talk about it. It's their dream. And I'm meeting them every day. And it's like 40 years sending their kids to university, mm -hmm. doing the work, you know, working extra years to get the, you know, cruising kitty up, you know, delay gratification, delay gratification, delay gratification. Then they buy the boat, they get it ready. It's always more than they anticipate. And then to have those electrical problems actually stop them. And at one point, maybe a voice of reason in the family says, you know what, this is this is just too hard. This is just too hard. We, we've got to get out. So let's talk a little bit about lithium because lithium is definitely probably, I would say, one of the hottest sort of topics in our field right now, especially within mm -hmm. the marine industry related to battery systems. And you brought up a good point about these concept of these drop-in replacements. It, it comes out, of course, um, people want it to be easy, right? They want the benefits of, you know, and I tell people, and correct, and chime in here. But for so me, I it's, see, you Jeff, know. You know um, uh, I think Melissa's just put up a shot of a uh, lithionics, mm -hmm. uh, lithium ion battery uh, with an external BMS. And this is one of those batteries that has a, a very uh, broad ability to communicate outside the battery. Um, and which is that little middle cable that you've got there as a communications cable. Um, so, uh, but this means this battery, it's not really a battery, it's an energy storage system. Because now we've got the capability to integrate this battery uh, with all the charging devices on the boat, for example, so that if the battery sees a condition in which it's, it's likely to get overcharged, it can send out a message to shut down the charging devices. Mm. Uh, if it sees a condition in which it, it's getting close to shutting down because of a lack of charge, it can send out a warning message and maybe uh, turn on one of those charging devices. Uh, so it's got that external communication capability. The other thing that, that I want in my boat with lithium ion, which I don't have at the moment, I do have lithium ion batteries, I'm, I won't discuss which brand they are. Um, but the other thing I want with my lithium ion batteries is a sticker on the battery that says it's tested to UL 1973. Uh, that's the most aggressive abuse testing standard in the marketplace, uh, in the marine marketplace at least. And it means uh, that whatever I do stupid, and I do do stupid things like everybody else, plus I, I push these, these systems to their published limits just to see what happens. I mean, it's part of what I do for a living. Uh, but with lithium ion, if you get it wrong, it's likely to go up in smoke and you lose the boat. So with that UL 1973 sticker on the battery, you can be pretty certain that there's just about nothing stupid you can do that's going to cause that battery to catch fire and you're going to lose the boat. So that's you would lose the boat. Yeah, yeah. there's no That's doubt. what I want on my uh, lithium-ion battery is that sticker on the side of the battery. 
says it's UL 17, 1973 tested. The, and there's, there's not many batteries have it because the testing is very expensive. Yeah, I actually really went to UL to see how they do that. Oh, yeah? Uh, oh, yeah, they do crazy stuff. Like uh, they put a battery in a with a metal screen around it and they put it in an oven and they heat it up until it explodes. Well, you know, which you can get pretty much any lithium ion battery to explode. Um, yeah. It has to have a battery case that's strong enough to make sure there's no projectiles that will come through the screen outside, the, you know, stuff like this. Um, they take one cell in the battery and they totally discharge it and then they fully charge all the other cells. So the battery is totally unbalanced. Uh, and then uh, they put it on a full out charge rate to see if they can drive that one cell into thermal runaway. Um, which will, in a lithium ion battery, well, again, it'll start a fire in the cell. Uh, so they do a lot of really, really, they take the BMS and uh, they introduce a, a fault to it. Uh, and it has to have a redundant capability so it can handle a single fault within the battery management system. Mm. So, uh, and of course, this all drives the cost of the batteries up uh, and it makes them expensive. But on the other hand, uh, what's peace of mind worth? Yeah, that's a challenge. You know, I see yeah. it all the day. And, you know, it's funny. People are buying, you know, some people, you know, we're, very few people are pulling lithium in a $10,000 value boat. You know, you're seeing, I see boaters that are buying, you know, catamarans for, you know, half a million, you know, 300, 400, 750, a million dollars, which sounds like an obscene amount of number. But I mean, that's some boats are costing that. And that's yeah. not on the top end. That's, you know, that's a 40 foot, 45 foot, 50 right. foot catamaran. Right. And and yet they they've spent X on the boat and then they're looking and I've had some owners and and it's it's almost like a misalignment in values and they're like yeah. I need to save as much money as humanly possible on a battery bank right. that will be either underneath my bed or <laughs> literally behind my head. Yes, and I yeah. tell them I'm like why would you yeah. why would you be a smoker and have a flammable couch? Right. Like you know I know it's less money to put right. flammable material on a couch, but why would you? want that and i think that's the problem is yeah. people can't connect the dots they 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 they're very um they just don't want to go there because the price well, that's is our much. job you have to help them connect the dots yeah yes it's and of course true. if we do it right they'll listen to us yep. yeah and that's what this i you know it goes back to uh it's a little bit the spirit of this conversation right is to try to people have a hard time being told what to do in general now, all of us, certainly myself, but if you tell me why I should do something, tell me the reasons, and you give me an explanation, and I'll come to the, that conclusion, then yeah, I'm all in. You know, and I think that's what it comes down to. It's not just telling them voters what they should or shouldn't do, but educating them as the reasons why we should do something mm -hmm. or the reasons we shouldn't. And then let most people will come to the same conclusions. Not everyone, because it all we all have different values. Excuse uh, me, scratching my nose. I was planting a grass this morning and i think i have a slightly allergic reaction to that grass seed <laughs> oh that's hilarious i this is allergy season right now i i could i could sneeze at any given moment and it could be uncontrollable for like like 30 seconds same thing i i, uh, I uh, always get a little hay fever and uh, so i really stirred it up today i think <laughs> so what are your reasons for doing lithium like what would you if you're talking for yourself the performance. you know it's the uh the energy density there's, there's on a volume or weight basis, there's probably, uh, people say four times as much or energy density or, or a quarter of the volume. But actually, by the time you put the BMS in and stuff like that, you're probably talking two to one. But mm. then, you know, if we got lead acid batteries, we normally speaking, we're using less than 50% of the capacity at each cycle. Yep. With lithium, we're probably using 70 if we really push it 80%. Um, so then you need less of them. So by the time you're done, you probably are talking uh, a quarter of the batteries for a similar performance. So, yeah. and then uh, if you have uh, maybe half as many batteries or, or even a, a similar amount, you've got way more performance. And in our case, you know, we developed that uh, integral system uh, uh, alternator that puts out eight kilowatts. Yeah, I saw that. So yeah. I need a, a battery bank that will absorb eight kilowatts of charging power. And on our boat, because we don't have air conditioning, uh, but we don't have, you know, fridge and freezer and uh, microwave and all kinds of bits and pieces. Uh, but in uh, on half an hour of engine runtime, when we're pulling up the anchor to get out of uh, an anchorage or we're leaving the dock, 
in, in the time it takes us to do that, we can put enough energy in that battery bank with that integral alternator to run the boat for 24 hours. Yeah, that's the dream. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, we've spent 40 years stressing over the state of charge of our batteries, like everybody else, you know, constantly checking the state of a charge, thinking maybe I better do a bit of battery charging at anchor. Uh, these last few years, because I've been wanting to push the system hard for test purposes, I've been doing stupid things like boiling water in an electric kettle at the same time as I'm boiling it in the microwave and then dumping hot water down the sink so that the hot water heater is running so that I can load the system up just to, just to see what it'll do. <laughs> at one point, we had eight kilowatts of electric heaters on the boat when we were testing. This was in Ireland. The weather was miserable. But there were times when we still had open every hatch and porthole on the boat to let the heat out because we had eight kilowatts of electric heaters running just so I could load the system up to see what it would do. So what size inverters do you have on board right now? We had eight kilowatt inverter. Yeah. How much? Eight kilowatts. So we had everything maxed out. I wanted to see what would break first. You know, By so the way, you know what? How big is your boat? Is it 45? It's 40. Well, it's, they call it a Marlow 46, but it's actually 48 feet. It's a, it's a and, no, you're the only one that has an eight kilowatt inverter on board, unless you have air conditioning. There's just, there's no... <laughs> like, like, yeah, I mean, there's no way we can use all the energy we can generate at the moment. Um, yeah. But uh, it's, uh, well, that's, that's basically one of the things I do is to try to test things to destruction to see what's going to break first. Uh, and and then uh, I'll get a hold of the manufacturer or whatever and say, you know, this is what happened. And then maybe they'll, they'll uh, fix it. Do they listen? Way. We know. Yeah, sometimes. Uh, and if not, we at least we know where the boundaries are. Yeah. And then uh, we can go ahead and make sure that we design systems that are pretty bulletproof. There was so, one point with that testing where, I'm, where I discovered a means to create a, something called a harmonic vibration. And I could break a belt in four minutes. You know, these are, these are timing belts. Rib timing belts off a car that we were using because they're very rugged. And I could make this belt go totally crazy and break a belt in four minutes. So, so then uh, the, uh, the manufacturer had to spend a ton of money figuring, figuring out how this was happening. Uh, nobody else could do it. It was, it was unique to our boat and certain speeds and, and uh, resonant features. And, and they figured it out and got to a point where I couldn't do it anymore. Uh, oh. so, yeah, <laughs> that's that. That's a. I mean, breaking things to learn things is a good way. I mean, we we don't intentionally break things. Uh, our client base do that for us, right? You yeah. know, the thousands of voters that we right. help out, yeah. and we learn from we learn from our own mistakes, other people's yeah. mistakes. Yeah, you know, as long as you're learning from the mistakes, then tomorrow is a better day. Yep. Yeah. yeah. So what's your charge rate going into your lithium bank? Uh, from well, the we've got, it's a 48 volt bank because otherwise the, um, the cables would be huge. Yeah. So uh, we're putting in, what well, we start out at eight kilowatts. So if we do the math, that's 8,000 divided by 50 is uh, 160 amps, I think. So it's a lot lower than we might be doing with a you know, high output alternator at 12 or 24 volts. Yeah. Um, but in terms of energy, you know, That's it's massive. twice as much as we can get from pretty much any other, even the best of the high output alternators on the market. Yeah, the, uh, that's right. You know, the, the APS alternators that Ocean Planet Energy sells, Yeah, those have terrific performance characteristics at 12 and 24 volts. So what's the output at low RPM on those alternators? What, what, um, what, do you, what makes it terrific? Like, what does it make so awesome? Well, there's two things. One is the, uh, the maximum output. Actually, there's three things. The maximum output, which is... Typically speaking, uh, these alternators are ready when they're cold. Yeah. Well, when you run them hard, within five minutes, they're uh, up to the, the case is probably up to well over 100 degrees centigrade. Um, so then they, they, uh, the output goes down. So then efficiency becomes really important. And those OPS alternators are some of the more efficient ones on the market. You know, the, the typical automotive alternator is maybe 50% efficient much of the time. Uh, these APS alternators are around 70%. Some of the Balmos are as well. Um, and then um, the other thing that's critical to all of us is that they ramp up their output at low RPMs. Yeah. Uh, especially if we're battery charging at anchor. Uh, because if you've got to run the engine, you know, at two and 3,000 RPM to get the alternator to, to wide open to a full output, you're not going to do it. No. So what you thought was a 200 amp alternator is really a 100 amp alternator. Yeah. 
Um, so that that is is a really critical feature is getting it to ramp up the output at low RPMs. And we spent a ton of money with the integral system working on that. And we got it to the point where with the engine at a thousand RPM, we're getting five kilowatts out of the uh, alternator. That's just amazing. Yeah, I mean, there's nothing on the market that comes close to it. So I can sit at anchor, I can run my engine at 1200 RPM, which is you know not much above idle speed. Yeah. And, uh, and it's also quite quiet. And uh, and that thing's putting out um, seven kilowatts. And I mean, it's, yeah, not it's, only it's, that, that seven kilowatts is enough of a load on the engine at that low speed to where I'm almost at the peak fuel efficiency for the engine. So I'm actually getting, even at anchor, generating like that, I'm more efficient than a standalone generator. Yeah, and that's what you want. It's that sweet spot. I saw the, I did, I saw your video that uh, I think it was about last year or maybe eighteen months ago that you released. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, you were wearing a lab coat. I saw I, you. They you gave looked me like that. such a scientist. Right. We're we're about to start the video, and they they gave that to me and made me wear it. I felt kind of stupid in it. But... I, I, you were such a scientist. I'm like Nigel doesn't need you could you could have come in there and sweats. I was like, no, no, it's Nigel, man. He doesn't need to pretend to be a scientist. <laughs> that's the one and only time I've ever worn a lab coat. I love it. I love it. I saw you on it. I'm like, no, no, this guy doesn't need to wear one. He yeah. doesn't, he doesn't, I mean, you can put one. You can wear one, but he doesn't need one. Yeah. But you know, we uh, we spent, oh, my nose is itching again. Um, we spent uh, $3 million of, of uh, some big corporation in the U.S. funded that project. $3 million developing that. Wow. Yeah. yeah. That was their yeah. money. And then we had other money that we put in. So it, it, it was a pretty intense uh, development program. The stuff in paper is really easy. We know exactly what we want to do, but uh, but actually making it all work and then building a controller that can handle that kind of power. And then uh, we, one of the tests I, I did was to uh, run the thing up to eight kilowatts and open circuit the batteries to see what oh, would happen. You know, with an alternator, you immediately smoke the alternator. You blow all the diodes. Yeah, that's what well, I heard. Our yeah. controller, reacted so fast and it had such a, a decent dump capability that it shut the system down without any damage oh wow that yep. quick yep <laughs> yeah that's what you want because otherwise you're going to lose right. that all i mean that alternator has right. got to be right you, you, can't, you don't want my, to uh, you know I, I drew up a list of design characteristics that i wanted to see in the thing i have no technical capability whatsoever to to make it happen but i know what we want because i've been doing this for long enough and dealing with the bits of kit that we have and the failings that they have. So I know what I want. Uh, it's a matter of finding the people that can then take that and translate it into a piece of kit that will do that. Yeah. And, and that's what we were able to do with that project. Yeah. So for, for the audience listening in, I mean, the challenge that we all have as voters, not, first of all, not all of us have generators. So you know, a lot of sailboats don't have generators. Of course, catamarans are having generators more and more now. But again, it depends on the size. Where are you going to put the generator? You know, I, you know, from a cost perspective, I could afford a generator on my own boat. You know, I would do one, but where am I going to put it? There's just no place. You know, I'm going to give up such a huge amount of space and it's going to be impossible to service. And so a lot of boaters are stuck with basically one engine and that's it. And it's not a money thing. It's just there's no other place. And so yeah. I think the play is, well, what can we do with alternators? And, yes. you know, we've been asking more and more of alternators. Well, how can, you know, it's 55, then 90 amps, then 120, then 160, 220. Three you know, six, th pardon? Three six, you know, one of those APS 12 volt alternators, I think is rated at 360 amps. Yeah. I believe it is. And that's just a regular small frame alternator. Yeah, unbelievable. And then... Um, uh, one of the 24 volt alternators is is rated at 260, I think, which is you know quite a bit more than that's that. That's huge, yeah. huge. I, I may be wrong on that. I can't remember off the top of my head. And then of course um, you need a pretty fancy controller, yeah. Because uh, when you're pumping out that much current, and uh, now we've got these uh, wake speed controllers, uh, which are like uh, the best of what we've had historically on steroids. I mean, that's oh, a yeah, it's unbelievable. really impressive piece of kit. But of course, the problem with that is uh, the, the more powerful these controllers get to be, the more complex they are to program. So you really have to have someone helping you. I mean, I can't program one of those yet. I haven't done it. 
I know what it can do. It's uh, mental. It's, it's, but it's I, a god I haven't, device. Actually, I haven't installed one yet. Um, so one of the things we, we've done at Ocean Planet is to create a little piece of kit that you can plug into uh, one of those that will give you a whole bunch of drop down menus to simplify the programming because it, it does get to be pretty complex. And if you screw up programming, then you're going to have problems. Yeah. yeah. I mean, that's a trade off, right? Uh, we, yeah. we, we yeah. as boaters, I tell the yeah. same thing with going back to lithium or anything. Yeah. You know, you, you can't have it both ways. You can't yeah. have all the benefits of technology and have simplicity. You know, you, yeah. you're going to trade off like complexity for more benefit. Yeah. And that's why I tell people with lithium, I'm like, are, do you need it or do you want it? Yeah. Like, are you, do you need a computer on top of your batteries? What's the reason why you need that level? And it might be, but not everyone needs all that complexity because the challenge is when it does break, then you either do it yourself or you call in a technician. Sometimes the technicians, aren't available uh, in your area or they're in your area, but they're not available for eight weeks, it's four weeks until they can come on board. And that's where people get really frustrated. Yeah. Yeah. And then, you know, we uh, we start pumping out power levels we've never dreamed of in the past. So then we need cables this big to handle it. And then uh, because we've got lithium ion batteries on the boat, they, they don't have that charge acceptance curve that their acid batteries have. So, so then the, uh, the charging device is running flat out for maybe an hour or two. And then we discover some tiny little thing, like we put an a &L fuse in there, with, uh, which has got stainless steel bolts to hold things together. And one of the washers finds its way between the cable lug and the fuel. Oh, yeah. You're done. And it's it's a stainless resistor. steel washer. It acts like a little resistor. It gets hot enough to where it melts the fuse, even though there's no overcurrent situation. 100%. It the alternator and it blows the alternator. Testify. Did it. Uh, right. One of my first jobs. Uh, right. Literally did it. 100%. I remember literally the fuse holder melted. Melted. Because that melted. Steel washer. It was a right. game changer. I was like, oh my God. And it's surprising how many of us, including myself, I mean, tons of that, those little washers are actually not conductive. Well, they are, but barely. But they are only 8% the conductivity of copper. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, and you see it all the time, yeah. by the way. You see oh. those washers in between things. Well, you know, you have the fuse holder. You have the fuse, you have the cable, you, you blow the fuse, you take the fuse out because you slide it sideways and pull it out. Yeah. The washer drops down. Yeah. You put the new fuse in and you don't notice you've now got a washer between the fuse and the cable. And it's yeah. this kind of stuff, you know, we uh, learn this stuff the hard way. Uh, and then there is no mechanism to feed this knowledge out to the rest of the industry. Uh, that's a big problem we have. Uh, I, I have a dozen photographs on file of brand new boats with stainless steel washers in the circuit on these a &L fuse holders. And these All are, the time. Yep. I'd say and it's that. honestly, it's a, it's a simple mistake that even I could do again. Yes. Knowing it, knowing what I know, knowing, you know, honestly, it, it shouldn't, you know, it, the fuse holder effectively is a bad design because to have some, no one is going to read a manual to put in a fuse. I mean, people don't even read a manual, put in an inverter. There's no way they're going to read a fuse yeah. manual. And uh, they just make the mistakes. The mistakes are bound to happen. Absolutely bound to happen. Yeah. 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 So I just want to finish up the lithium. So for you, the lithium, what I'm hearing, obviously, energy density is a big one. Uh, communication, um, and this is definitely the holy grail, with different like not just sensing voltage or measuring current, which mm -hmm. is basically voltage sensing is how pretty much most charging is done right now. Yeah. Uh, wake speed is actually using current as a way right. to also yep. assess the situation, which is great. Yeah. And I, that's, I think, why so many of us are fans of the product. But having a battery talk back and say, hey, I need this, I want that, here's where I am, that's... I mean, there's complexity there for sure, but there is a lot of benefit there. Yeah. For but now let, let's talk a fallacy of lithium ion. Uh, we all know they have a really high cycle life. They are iron phosphate, which is most of the batteries we see, but has um, at least 2,000 cycles if it's yeah. treated properly. So if you do the math, um, you, you say I can get 70% out every cycle and I got 2,000 cycles, and then you assume that you can do all of that. 
Uh, and then you look at the cost of the battery as compared to lead acid, and you do the same analysis with lead acid. It turns out that in the long run, lithium ion is cheaper than lead acid. Mm -hmm. However, the fallacy here is to assume that you're going to get those 2,000 cycles. I have never met a boater yet that, that cycled the battery 2,000 times. So if you only cycle that battery, say, 300 times, because you only use the boat half a dozen weekends of the year, um, then uh, it's way more expensive than a lead acid battery for the energy that you, you put in and out of that battery. So we have to, we have to acknowledge that the, the single strongest talking point in terms of the cost benefit of lithium mine is probably not one that most boat owners can actually use because we don't have the capability to, to exploit that high cycle life. Yeah, and, I, and, and that's where I get always concerned when a product is using some sort of same thing would be Nigel to me is the three C thing. You know, it, a lot of people are advertising like, oh, you know, lithium can charge at three times capacity. It's nonsense. Oh, you look at the lithium batteries we have in the rain marketplace, and most of them don't want to be charged at more than 0.3 C. Yeah, which actually and, is substantially less than an AGM battery. And even where are you going to find that charger? I'm like, yeah. okay, three C. Yeah. Okay, let's great, awesome. Perfect. All right. Good. No problem. Congratulations. Yeah. Good. All right. Now tell me where you're going to, okay. Your battery bank is, let's call it a 400 amp hour battery bank at 12 volts. That's four golf cart batteries. That is not a big battery bank. You know, 400 amp hours is a tiny battery bank for any boat above 30 feet. Uh, right. I mean, it's, it's, it's vanilla. Like there's nothing to it. It's like, it's just a sedan, four doors. That's it. It's basic. I'm like, okay, 400 amp hours. Do 3C of that, 1,200 amps. Okay. Yep. Start looking online for a 1,200 amp charger, 600 amp charger, 300 amp charger. Yep. Yep. You know, where are you going to find a charger that is ever going to give you the benefits of that theoretical yep. charge rate? Well, in any case, we don't have that charge rate with the batteries we're using because those are automotive batteries where they're built for acceleration and they're also built to handle massive braking, regenerative braking spikes. So right. in the boat world, we have energy batteries that are designed to uh, accept and deliver energy much more slowly. So yeah. most of the boat batteries, lithium ion batteries we have, uh, are looking at 0.3C, not 3C, one tenth of yeah. that charge rate. Many of some of them will go to 0.5C and a handful of them will go to 1C. In my yeah. own boat, because we've got that integral um, alternator that will put out eight kilowatts and we had an eight kilowatt uh, battery bank, eight kilowatt hour, then I wanted the 1C rate. And in terms of the available lithium ion batteries in the boat world, that's pushing the boundaries of most of those batteries. Mm -hmm. Many of them, they don't want to do that. So uh, whereas actually you can pump 1C into any AGM battery up to about 50% state of charge. So ironically, uh, there are AGM batteries which will accept a higher charge rate than a lot of the lithium ion batteries we have. But of course, they start to taper off once they get to 60% state of charge and then, and then it tapers off pretty rapidly. Yeah, so tell me what's your, um, with all the advancements that we've seen in lead acid over the years, certainly, I mean, you're know, going from flooded lead acid and then we went to the mm -hmm. seal valve regulated AGMs or gel. And now we've got these foam core AGMs. Um, what's your thoughts? I remember still you had said in that presentation that years ago we were all attending like lead acid batteries are you know, they don't die, they're murdered is the expression right. yes. that you said. And I've reused that, Nigel. I can't tell you how many times I've reused that because, yeah. oh man, is it true? Yeah. People just just give it to the battery. So tell me a little bit about the state of the batteries, of lead acid batteries, and what's your take on, you know, for boaters and cruisers out there that want to go out. Well, what's it? Yeah, tell me a little bit more. Well, the first thing is if you're not in a hurry to wait a year or two. Uh, the, the lead industry is pumping millions and millions of dollars into research to improve AGM batteries, um, to make them competitive with lithium ion. And uh, they actually they now have the capability of the Argonne National Lab in the USA, one of these federally funded labs, where they can, they can watch what's going on inside a battery at fundamental levels of physics and chemistry while the battery is in operation. So all... Um, uh, development in the past has been empirical. You change something, the electrolyte or the plate, and you test it and see what happens. But now they can see in real time what's going on inside the battery. And we've known forever 
the, even when we 100% discharge a battery, we're actually only using 50% of the theoretical capability of a lead acid battery. So we've never been able to figure out how to unlock the other half. So if they come even close to doing that, then okay. we're going to see a dramatic improvement in the capability of lead acid batteries. And then the other two things they, they need for the uh, mild hybrid automotive world, mild hybrids are the one that when you stop at a traffic light, the engine shuts off. And then uh, as soon as you hit the uh, accelerator pedal, it, it cranks up again. So the battery is cycled thousands and thousands of times at a high level of charge. Mm. But then they also want to be able to recover the braking energy. So they need to maintain the battery in a partial state of charge so that when you brake, you can put that energy into the battery. So, you know, as we know, if you put a lead acid battery in a partial state of charge, it dies from sulfation. So they need to cure the sulfation issue. They need to get a very high cycle life and they need to get higher energy density. And if they get even one of those things, let alone three of them, lead acid batteries are going to get a lot better quite quickly. So we need to keep an eye on that. And at the moment, by far the best lead acid technology for our purposes is, is the Firefly battery with the carbon foam plates. Mm. Um, for the simple reason, that uh, it's an AGM battery, so it has the normal AGM characteristics in terms of charge acceptance and so on. But uh, you can operate it in a partial state of charge for weeks at a time and it doesn't sulfate. And it's the only lead acid battery in the market that doesn't sulfate. It acts like it's sulfating at every cycle. You see the capacity diminish a little bit, but when you get the opportunity to do a normal full charge again, oh, those uh, sulfates all go back into solution. And it goes back to 100%. Do you know why that. that's the case? Yeah. Well, I think I do. You know, I know physicists, but um, the negative plate is made from a sheet of foam, literally. So it's got a tiny pore structure. And when they uh, make the batteries, they, they create a vacuum in the battery and they suck the paste into that plate. Okay. And then when you leave a battery in a partially discharged state, the, the, uh, the paste turns to lead sulfate. And it's in a crystal form. And initially, the crystals are very small and they're easily recharged. But if you leave it like that, they, they grow together into bigger crystals. So first of all, they have less surface area collectively. So it takes longer to recharge them. And secondly, they become more resistant to charging. So the battery slowly refuses to take charge. And, uh, and then uh, unless you crank the voltage up, uh, well above a normal charging voltage, you can't recover those sulfated crystals, the big ones. Mm. So then the next time you discharge it, leave it in a discharge state, some more of those happen, and you get a progressive loss of capacity. Well, I think the pore structure in the foam is too small to allow the crystals to grow to the size where you can't recover them with normal charge rates. I think it's as simple as that. So yeah, I may the, be totally wrong. Yeah, the inventor <laughs> is that's what nearby. I think isn't the inventor of that battery? Uh, he lives here in Lang, down the road. From yeah, us, twenty miles. <laughs> yeah, he's very a really neat guy. Yeah, I yeah. I have six batteries. On I mean, I've got Firefly on my boat. Um, you know, the, one of the challenges, of course, is that minimum 0.2 C that they want as a charge well, rate. Which no, is, actually, they want 0. 0.4. Well, now, yeah, they ideally they want 0. 0.4. Right. Minimum yeah. is 0. 0.2. Right. 0. 0.4 right. is almost impossible to give. In most not if you have uh, one of these <laughs> super high-powered alternators. I mean, that's another reason for, for you know putting all these pieces together as a package. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. Yep. Absolutely. Yeah. Yep. That's. I mean, the luckily thing is at least the power motors that have generators. You know, what we end up doing is stacking multiple uh, inverter chargers. Yeah. You yep. know, or adding multiple chargers. You know, the, the yep. most I've done ever is 350 amps at 24 volts so basically 700 amps of charging at 12 and uh, it was on about an 80 80 footer and uh, on 12 of those firefly l15s uh-huh um so 900 amp hours at 12 at 24 volts and we were able to off the generator i mean the generator is massive it was like i don't know 30 kilowatt or something uh -huh. it was yep. huge yep um and they could they could literally run in in concurrently three of one inverter charger and two of those chargers and it was a little bit the dream that you had talked about mm -hmm. about you know having even a large boat like that an 80 footer which is basically bigger than a house mm -hmm. uh literally being able to recharge their batteries in a couple hours yeah and in a couple hours doing an hour at night an hour in the in the morning and at reasonable times 
they're literally running the rest of the boat. The other 22 hours, yeah. the boat is running off batteries. Yep. And during those two hours, they could you know, maybe run the washing machine or cook. Yeah. Or Water so, maker. Whatever. Yep. Yep. Yeah. We, uh, we took some of those um, Firefly batteries and um, I, I would run them for a month at a time in a partial state of charge. I would cycle them for between 10 and 20% state of charge and 60%. Um, and the minute the charge acceptance rate dropped below uh, 0.3C rate, I shut them down. So that okay. was my cutoff threshold. And over the month, I did this every day, um, you could see the the whole battery would walk down a little, just like it was self active At the end of the month, I would stick it back on a on an extended charge cycle at 14.4 volts, you know, your normal um, charge cycle, uh, and it would go back to 100% state of charge. And then I'd do it again for the next month. So I, I did that for three or four months at a time, four months that year, I think. And then I took the batteries and I discharged them down to 35% state of charge and I let them sit for eight months. So, and then I uh, put them back on a normal charge cycle. They came back to 100% state of charge. Uh, and then the next year, I, I did a whole bunch of pretty aggressive and, and brutal treating, treatment on them. I didn't break a single one of those batteries. Temperature sensors. I see them taped on the top of the battery every time. They don't I know. They do a bit of good on the top of the battery. They got to be yeah, there's an air pocket. on the side of the battery. <laughs> they, if you bolt them to the post, that's one thing. And they should be bolted to the negative post because that's the one that gets the most heat. But uh, positive post is okay. But if they're not bolted to the post, they've got to be at least halfway down the side of the battery because otherwise uh, they're not working because there's an air pocket in the top of the battery that acts as an insulator. And I see it over and over again on brand new boats. They, they've All got the time. sensors in the wrong place. Yeah, it's you know it's funny. We we do the same thing. We do a service called an electrical audit, and this is where we get a lot of our knowledge. To be honest, it, you know. Going on people's boats, the the amount, your, my imagination is incapable of dreaming the things that I've seen on boats. <laughs> yeah. And the good news is, you know, collectively, we're learning a lot. Mm -hmm. You know, unfortunately, some of us are paying the price and others are learning from those mistakes. I had a I had a boat owner, you know, they, they swapped out, again, on temperature sensors, they swapped out the inverter for a different one. They reused the old temp sensor because it had a phone jack on it. The old one was a phone jack. The new one needed a phone jack. But the the I guess the scale was completely off in terms of what their resistor was expecting to be reading. And uh, they literally killed their battery bank because their temperature sensor told them that they were on thermal runaway. And their battery charger was basically practically not charging. Uh -huh. the yep. Yep. And uh, they lost their battery bank. And that battery bank was probably about five six thousand okay. uh, dollars yep. for a temperature yep. sensor that had not been switched yeah it's painful yeah, i've got some uh photographs of some uh, a big agm bank you know these are seven hundred dollars each uh where they're all melted down um because the temperature sensor was on the top and, yeah. and they did go into and they did go into thermal runaway and the temperature sensor didn't know there was anything going on i've seen i've seen temperature sensors not even installed in the battery I've seen them installed. They're more like ambient temperature sensors. Uh -huh. Yep. I've yep. seen them installed. I saw a boat that had thermal runaway. Yep. It was installed actually on a, the negative distribution. Huh. Oh, so talking about ambient temperatures, here's another one that I think is going to get us into trouble. Um, you know, we've been talking about high output alternators and we've been talking about lithium ion batteries. Well, you put those two together and those alternators are running really hard for extended periods of time. And even if they're 70% efficient, the uh, case temperature on the alternator is going to be well above 100 C. Uh, typically speaking, we'll set a temperature center at maybe 110 C, or maybe as high as 120. On the uh, integral system, we'll actually go to 200 C. Uh, and I ran it to 200 C to, to see what would happen. Well, what, yeah. what happened was it, it uh, sent enough heat through the rotor to where it destroyed the belts. <laughs> <laughs> the the was okay. But anyway, so we're, we're well above 100 C on the case. And then, uh, you know, you've got fans. Typically, you've got one at each end blowing out the middle, but it may, may be sucking and blowing out the ends. But somewhere, we've got all of that hot air coming out of the alternator. And if we have a fire suppression system in the engine compartment, and it has a temperature sensor, oh. that temperature sensor trigger is triggered at 79 C. If that temperature sensor is in the path for the air 
coming off that alternator, you'll trigger the fire suppression system. That can. Be and good. we're going to see uh, more and more of that happening because we're going to uh, the heat off of these uh, powerful alternators is going to heat up these small engine compartments, and then yeah. they're going to trigger the fire suppression system. And if it's a dry powder system, it will destroy the engine. Yeah, so because again, the air intake. Yep. If yeah. so, so the other thing we need to do first of all, we need to move those sensors to where they're not anywhere near to the alternator, and secondly, we need to make sure that the boat owners are using uh, gas cylinders and not dry powder. Uh, and typically, they like the dry powder because it's it's a bit cheaper, but it's oh, a, wow. a yeah, lot more yeah. expensive if it destroys the engine. <laughs> oh, that, um, that, that would be a bad, honestly, you get out of boating after, and there's not that many people who would stay in boating after that. No, well, I actually, I was on a brand new um, boat in, in England, came down the river from the boatyard, fresh out of the yard, lithium batteries, uh, high output alternator, uh, triggered the temperature sensor on, on the way down the river from the boat from the boat vehicle and destroyed the engine. Uh, so then they immediately had to haul it back out and put a new engine in it. Uh, yeah, that, that's uh, a bad thing. I told them what I thought was the problem and they said, no, oh, that's not possible. It could, there's no way it could do that. So I, I'm hoping they moved that temperature sensor or by now they may have done it again. <laughs> <laughs>